You're listening to Protocols in Action with Researched Nutritionals, hosted by founder and CEO, Dennis Schoen. How are you doing, Dr. Wakely? I'm well, how are you? Hey, I'm doing just great. I'm super excited for this. Well, good. I'm glad you're joining us. <clears throat> Let me give a little a short introduction and uh, and then we'll get going. Um, so for all the listeners, I'm, I'm Dennis Schoen. I'm the, the founder and CEO of Research Nutritionals. I founded the company really to develop targeted nutritional supplements that uh, would help people dealing with specific issues. And the idea behind it, though, was that we would back it by clinical research to, that both the patient and the doctor would know what to expect with the products. And so we get that clinical research published in peer-reviewed journals. And I think it's one of the exciting things that, that we do as a company. Um, our mission also is to promote practitioner education. And that's where we get talented and creative practitioners, such as today's guest, which is Dr. Christopher Wakeley, who practices in Seattle, to share with us you know, what he does in his practice. Dr. Wakeley is a fully licensed naturopathic physician completing his naturopathic medical education at Bastyr University. He works with patients experiencing complex chronic health challenges who typically have seen between 11 and 17 physicians before finally seeing him. His focus is on environmental toxicity, whether from metals, mycotoxins, chemicals, as well as with patients who are exposed to vector-borne challenges. Dr. Wakeley also works with patients that are dealing with the impact of autoimmune and mast cell issues. He's a member of the clinical faculty at Bastyr University and has received a variety of postgraduate training, including at NESH, A4M, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, and the, Interna or excuse me, the International Peptide Society. Uh, so again, Dr. Wakeley, thank you for joining us. Um, I, I've got a question for you. Um, I mean, my experience, I've been in the industry for 35 plus years now. And um, what I have found is doctors who practice as I know you practice, um, they have incredible passion for what they do, but they also have a deep personal connection um, that really drove them into this area. So why don't you share with the listeners about your journey to you know, where you are and how you got here? Yeah, I'd love to, Dennis, and thanks for the introduction. And again, I'm super excited to, to be doing this. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, so my journey into, into natural medicine and medicine in general was really kind of circuitous. Um, I grew up in Maine, and um, that's in New England for people who live, <laughs> for people for the who live on, lesson. On, the, on the West Coast. They're, they're like, is, it, is that in England? I'm like, no, New England. Um, just kind of a blue blue collar kid. Um, grew up with my mother and my grandmother. And um, my mother never felt well when I was growing up. She almost died when I was four years old. And um, but, you know, self-medicated a lot with, you know, kind of over the counter painkillers and um, alcohol and stuff like that. She ended up dying when I was 16, <clears throat> excuse me, of cancer. And then my grandmother, who also raised me, died two years later. And, mm -hmm. you know, I became an adult and kind of spent the um, years of probably 19 through 21 doing what, you know, a lot of my friends were doing, which was partying and kind of living on Pop-Tarts and Cheetos and Fresca. And so, it, you know, what I'm saying is I didn't grow up in a household that was really focused um, on, you know, nutrition and uh, preventative medicine and, and stuff like that. So when I was in my, in my twenties, I got, I mean, really fat, really, really obese. I was about 85 pounds heavier than I am now. I was super tired all the time. I had a lot of joint pain, constant headaches, um, probably would have been diagnosed with ADD or ADHD if that was more of a common thing. Um, when I was a kid and then my girlfriend at the time who 24 years later is now my wife ended up buying me a book on hydration of all things on water. And it was written by a, a physiologist, MD physiologist. And I was just floored. Couldn't believe it. And started looking more into natural supplements and, you know, started with the easy stuff, right? Like vitamin C and, and things like that. And I, I didn't even know, I thought vitamins were for weirdos. Um, 
Like my dad used to take vitamins and I'd be like, that's weird. Um, so as I got, as I got older, I kind of had some health experiences and some doctors who had helped me that kind of spurred me to think about medicine. So I ended up going back to school, getting another bachelor's degree, um, and then applied. I was going to go to the university of new England to become a doctor of osteopathy, a DO. And like at the last second, the 11th hour, I decided that I was going to apply to Bastyr because when I was doing all my, all my shadowing with residents and fellows and specialists um, to kind of get ready for med school, they kept telling me, like, are you sure? <laughs> are, you, are you sure you want to you sure you want to do this? And um, I was always bugging them like, well, you know, have you thought about giving, you know, vitamin C for that patient whose wound isn't healing? And, <clears throat> you know, I just. I just read something about, you know, thymine or dexpanthenol or, or whatever. And, and they were like, yeah, no, that's, that's not what we do. So, um, I went to Bastyr and, you know, that, so naturopathic medical, naturopathic medical school, I did that for five years. And in my training there, I was really blessed because I got to precept or shadow with some doctors that were doing some very cutting edge therapies and treating very, very complicated patients, uh, way more complicated than the patients that we were seeing at the clinic when I was in, in medical school. And then I started learning about environmental medicine. And that's kind of when I had my light bulb moment, like, oh, so many people are sick. So many people have so many things. This is definitely a big piece of the puzzle. And I think, uh, um, I mean, at the time, you know, a lot of physicians were, were kind of missing it. So that, that's kind of how we got into it. It's interesting, uh, because again, I am fortunate, I think being in this industry, which, which I love and have the ability to interact with so many different practitioners and over the, the, I should say decades, hard to imagine it's been that long, but anyway, um, what's changed over the years is when I'm talking to practitioners, it used to be that a patient would come in with a single issue. But what I hear from most practitioners now is there's no way. I mean, they're coming in with so many issues and then it's trying to figure out how do you do it? Um, and, and really what's going on? Why are so many people so sick and fighting so many different things simultaneously? Yeah. Don't that is definitely the case now. Um, and I think it, you know, I have my own view of, of looking at things, but, you know, in the decade that I've been practicing medicine, I, I feel like I've kind of boiled it down to three things. The, the first thing is most people aren't doing what human beings are designed to do. So, you know, we're not breathing fresh air, we're not getting enough sunlight, we're not eating the food that's right for our individual unique physiology. Um, we're probably not drinking enough water, or if we are, maybe the water isn't suitable for our physiology. So those are kind of what I call external terrain features. So things that we can mostly control. Um, exercise is another example, right? We were designed to move. I mean, Pre-hominids were walking somewhere between 12 and 15 miles a day. I don't know anybody that does that. I, I can't do that. I mean, I, I have to go to work. Um, so I don't think patients would appreciate me taking their case while I'm on a treadmill. Um, so those are the external things. And then then there's this, this group of what I call internal terrain problem. So this is the stuff that most doctors are going to look at, right? They're going to look at genetics. They're going to look at the cellular environment, the mitochondria, um, hormones, organ systems, like how's the liver functioning? How's the kidney functioning? How, you know, the, the skin and the gut and, and all that stuff. And both of those are really, really, really important. And they both, they both matter and they both need to be addressed. But I think the third area that a lot of people are missing, and it again, it's becoming more prevalent now to hear about this, is what I call 
toxic terrain modifiers, or sometimes Dennis and I, we, we talk about these as pets, pathological external terrain susceptibilities. And well, what does that mean? Well, those are things that are in your environment that you have little to no control over, that you get exposed to whether you want to or not. So a great example would be heavy metals or mold or certain bacteria or viruses. Um, so I think when to answer your question, um, I think the reason why so many people are coming in with these complicated health issues and not just one or two symptoms is because we've kind of gotten into this phase where we, we're in a perfect storm. We have problems with our internal terrain. So what's going on in our cellular environment? We're not doing the things that we're supposed to be doing for our unique physiology in the external terrain stuff. And then we have these toxic terrain modifiers like metals and mold and viruses and chemicals, pesticides, glyphosate, things like that, that are assaulting us and changing how our internal terrain behaves, right? And so for my patients, I focus a lot on those things because I feel like if something's wrong with the cellular environment, or something's going wrong with how the organ systems are working working on a functional level, my question is always why, right? Like, let's look behind the veil and figure out what's in the way there. And well, it's, it's, it's interesting. And so really what's happening, I mean, the, the onslaught, the, the, the nonstop assault on, on all of us um, is happening faster than our bodies have evolved to to actually deal with it right so that's sounds like that's where you come in you're sort of coming in and where where the body hasn't kept up or isn't hasn't been able to modify itself yet then it's up to somebody like you to come in and, and figure out all of this yeah that's what i do and um man i wish it was easy you know <laughs> it's not because it's not supposed to be weekly <laughs> yeah that's, that's what they keep telling that's... me I should mention, um, I, I, I call Dr. Wakely Wakely because uh, his family and friends and peers all call him Wakely. So uh, yeah. just FYI. Go ahead, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I know my wife calls me Wakely. So <laughs> Wakely, um, lead, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wakely, be quiet. Um, yeah. I, so I wish it was easy that the thing that I have found in my practice is that when people come in and they're complaining of, you know, I mean, I'm usually getting, like when I see a new patient, uh, what we call a chief complaint list is usually somewhere between seven and 12 things, you know? So it's not just, I don't feel good or my knee hurts or, you know, whatever. It's all seven or 10 or how many symptoms they have. They all been going on for a long time. They're all really significant. And in my clinical experience, it's usually more than one thing that's causing those individual symptoms. So I always tell patients, I, I tend to use a lot of analogies. It's just how I think. But I will tell them, this process is going to be like peeling an onion. Or this process is going to be like trying to get to the center of your Tootsie Pop. We may have something on top that you're showing up with right now um, that could potentially help one or two symptoms. And then when we peel that layer off, okay, well, what layer are we in now? We have to identify that. We have to work through that. Um, and, you know, when you're doing that, you also have to support the internal terrain. You have to support the internal cellular structure in the organ systems and work with people on teaching them how to do things that are going to be right for their body that they can control. So, you know, not everybody should be on a carnivore diet. Not everybody should be on a vegan diet. Not everybody should drink their body weight in fluid ounces of water a day. Some people do really well with coffee. Some people don't. So it's those unique little things that 
you know, those are the puzzle pieces that I guess I'm, I'm trying to put together with, with the help of my patients, of course. So when you're looking at that many issues, how do you determine which issue or issues to hit first? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So there's a couple different ways. I mean, obviously symptoms and signs, so physical examination and then what they're complaining about is a big piece of the story. Um, and, you know, a lot of times there are par particular symptoms that to me kind of point toward one particular environmental toxin versus another. Um, so it, I'll just give you an example. And of course, there's caveats to this, but um, like if somebody comes in and they're experiencing a lot of burning pain, you know, like my tongue burns, my throat burns. Anytime I have pain in my joints, it burns. Um, I tend to think about, well, that could be a, that could be a, a latent viral issue because there's a lot of different viruses that will cause the symptom of burning in different areas of the body. Um, if somebody's coming in and they have AFib and a lot of muscle twitches and ratcheting, you know, when I test their strength, there's a lot of ratcheting or tremors and there's neuropathy and maybe some cognitive issues, then I might be thinking a little bit more about mold and mycotoxins and heavy metals, for example, like cadmium and arsenic. Um, and then there's other other ways that, you know, that we diagnose things too. Um, I use autonomic response testing in my practice. And then, you know, we tend to run a lot of labs on people. So we'll do urine tests, stool tests, saliva tests, and blood, obviously a lot of blood labs. Are there, are there certain labs that stand out to you that you believe very strongly can, can help other practitioners also? Oh boy. Yeah. I mean, I've got a laundry list um, <laughs> of labs. I mean, I, it's I feel sad, but, but it's good <laughs> you have it. <laughs> I feel bad for my patients sometimes because I'll, yeah, this actually happened yesterday where, you know, I looked at a woman and I said, this is going to be like, make sure you're hydrated <laughs> when you, when you go into the lab, because it's, it's probably going to be a bunch of vials. Um, so I'm always checking, you know, what we call a CBC, which is a complete blood count that looks at white blood cells and red blood cells and some other things too. Um, <clears throat> and there's some different things that you can look at with a CBC that are pretty, pretty easy to figure out if a patient is maybe bacterial dominant, viral dominant, or if they're having a histamine problem or, you know, potentially even a parasite problem. I always look at liver and kidney function. That's, you know, very important protein levels and things like that. And then there's other more kind of eclectic tests that I do. I run, I run a lab on all my new patients called a CD57 count, which is a branch of a highly specialized branch of the immune system that's been correlated with, with some different illnesses. Um, I always check vitamin D levels. Um, yeah, I mean, hormones, you know, I'm always looking at testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, uh, thyroid function is a, is a big deal because, you know, thyroid, thyroid function has a lot to do with how people are feeling metabolically. Um, and if, if they're coming in to see me, I can almost guarantee that they don't have energy. Like they're not feeling good. Right. Um, and that can be due to a lot of different things, but an easy rule out is, you know, checking thyroid function and, and, and don't just check TSH. TSH is a great test. TSH is essentially a test that, that is answering the question, how loud is the brain yelling at the thyroid? Thyroid stimulate, make hormone, TSH. Um, it says nothing about what the thyroid is actually doing downstream. And it, it, it certainly do, doesn't tell us anything about what's actually happening at the cellular level um, with thyroid function. And, you know, is that hormone even being able to get, get onto the receptor and get into the cell to alter DNA, you know, transcription? So what are some of the other, I guess, down, 
you know, beyond just the brain instructing the thyroid what to do. When you're looking downstream, what are, what are the other thyroid uh, areas that you're looking at or tests that you're running? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I always check a free T4 level. Um, that's really important because that, you know, T4 is what the thyroid pumps out. And it's, you know, a, um, it's an amino acid with four little iodine groups on it. And that is an inactive hormone. Um, that extra iodine on there is to um, safely shuttle that thyroid hormone to the environment where it need where it needs to go. Um, and then I look at T3 levels. And that's really important because that's what is metabolically active and that's what's going to dock on the receptor of the cells and actually change DNA transcription and pro, you know help provide metabolic assistance to the cellular environment. Um, and then one of the, I always check autoantibodies on every every just about every single patient to make sure that there's no you know Hashimoto's or you know Graves disease or anything like that. But then I also look at uh, a test that, you know, in medicine, we debate about its rel um, how relevant it is, but it's called reverse T3. And I always talk to patients and say, you know, if T3 is active hormone, that's like stepping on the gas pedal in your car. Reverse T3 is like stepping on the brakes. So some patients will make enough T4, that shuttle bus that's safely moving that thyroid hormone around the body. But then when an enzyme comes in to clip off one of those iodine molecules and turn T4 into T3, they're not converting appropriately. And they will actually shunt towards making reverse T3, which is essentially you're trying to get somewhere in your vehicle, but you're riding the brake the whole time. Um, so I always check that. And a lot of patients come back with really, really high reverse T3 levels. So that's something that, you know, we need to correct. And how long does it normally take you to, to correct or see changes in, you know, in the thyroid output and, and proper output? Well, it definitely depends on the patient. Um, that's the, you know, I mean, it depends, <laughs> right? That's like my favorite, my favorite answer in, in medicine. <laughs> that doesn't count. No, uh, no, I know. And it's, it's totally lame. Um, but it's so, it's so true. Um, and it, it depends on which direction the patient wants to go. So if they want to use just natural approaches to it, um, we can get there. It's probably going to take a little bit longer. And if we use pharmaceutical approaches and natural approaches at the same time, usually it's a little bit quicker. So I would say, you know, if there's no autoimmune disease, so if the immune system isn't attacking the thyroid, saying, you're our enemy, we need to destroy you, then usually we can come in with, you know, some nutraceuticals and potentially some pharmaceuticals and Correct the thyroid pretty quickly. What does that mean? I don't know. It depends. <laughs> no, <laughs> like three months, six months, some somewhere in that, somewhere in that change. So, so while you're working on thyroid and going through that period of time to correct it, what other things are you trying to do, or areas that you think you need to focus on? I, I guess even more immediately or during that time as well. Well, I'm definitely working on 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 what I call the free stuff. So things that people can do at home to help their bodies function a little bit better. So, you know, are you drinking tap water? Okay, um, you know, I, I love that we can turn on a faucet and, and get clean water that doesn't have Giardia in it. That's awesome. But those disinfection byproducts that the water waste treatment facilities put in there get into our system. So that's usually a change I'll have patients make. I want them drinking filtered water. Um, we figure out what diet that they need to eat in order for them to be metabolically optimized. How much are you sleeping? What's the quality of your sleep? Are you exercising? Are you sweating? Um, so those things are all included in my first treatment plan. And usually that's a page and a half 
write up sometimes two pages, um, you know, depending on how much we need to do. I'm always working on what I call the emunctories, which is just a $5 word for <laughs> organs of elimination. So how well is your gut working? It, you know, functionally, how well is your liver working? I'm not talking about liver pathology, right? We're not talking about somebody coming in with liver enzymes that are 400. That's a totally different problem. What I'm talking about is how well are you, I mean, the colloquial term that people throw around is detoxing, right? Um, how are your kidneys working? How's your brain working? Um, so I'm always working on on those things. Those are really, really important and then I'm getting into the onion. You know, I'm getting into those layers of, you know, a patient comes in. Okay, I lived in a moldy building. I worked in a moldy building. Um, all my symptoms started started then. So, you know, then we're working, you know, on that layer. Or I was bit, I was bit by an insect when I was traveling in Southeast Asia. And I've never been the same since. Or I got hit by a car. I got in a bad car accident and got bad whiplash. And then all of my symptoms started after that. So it's kind of a, you know, I'm always looking at more than one variable at a time. And um, because in, in my experience, <laughs> if you just look at one variable at a time, you end up playing whack-a-mole. You remember that game in the arcades? <laughs> where you sure. hit one thing and then five other things pop up. So, you know, if you're going to deal with somebody who, let's say, has heavy, a high heavy metal load in their system, yeast is involved in that process of, you know, kind of walling off some of those metals and vice versa, you know. Um, so, you, you know, you need to look at both of those at the same time, too. So... It's it's kind of a serpiginous answer to your question, Dennis, and I'm sorry, but it's I'm always doing multiple multiple things for my. Well, patients. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, everyone each person is different, and they're presenting with different infections or or autoimmune issues or whatever else it might be. So yeah, I think a, a unique approach to it is is good. Are there certain things that um, you do? I mean, you mentioned what well. well detox, which I think obviously environmentally, we probably need a lot of that, that you like from a detox standpoint or metabolically for help with the fatigue or any of those types of things that you, you often do that, you know, that, that you think your patients are really benefiting by. Yeah. I mean, I have a large list, but I would say if, <laughs> if, if somebody held a gun to my head and said, if you want to help with appropriate detoxification or depuration, um, getting bad things out and turning things that are very toxic into something that is less toxic, then probably my first stop would be, don't pull the trigger. Let's put everybody in America on glutathione. <laughs> that's, that's probably what I would say because um, it's such an important antioxidant and we make it. You know, the human body makes glutathione um, and, and, and that's great, you know, good job, body, good job, physiology, making glutathione, but we're not designed to handle the amount of toxicity that's coming at us from an environmental perspective. I don't think our glutathione manufacturing can keep up with the toxic insults. So that, that, that would be the first one that I would put people on, um, would be, would be glutathione. You know, and I hear, you know, uh, you know, I think quite a few doctors, um, use NAC as a way of, <laughs> of trying to boost glutathione. I mean, what's, what's your thought on that? Yeah. Uh, that's funny. Um, <laughs> so, okay. I, so I love NAC. I don't, I don't hate NAC. I take NAC occasionally. <clears throat> what I don't do is I don't take NAC to boost my glutathione levels. It's, it's kind of like, um, it, it's kind of like 
asking if the grass that grows on your lawn is food. Like, can you eat it? Sure, you could you could go eat it, but it's really not that helpful. So let me, do you mind if I kind of like dive into that question a little bit? Uh, go right ahead. I think probably a lot of our listeners would be very interested in your thoughts. Yeah, so with, with N-acetylcysteine, NAC, the first thing that needs to happen is you well number one you need to absorb it right and for a lot of patients that have a complex chronic illness their absorption ability for micronutrients and vitamins and supplements and stuff like that is compromised um so that's step number one step number two is nac has to get taken apart um and then the amino acids that make up NAC, which are cysteine, glycine, and I think glutamate, um, have to get put back together. So you've got to absorb it. Okay, That's an area where you can have a disruption. You have to take it apart. You can have a problem in that, in that step of the manufacturing process or whatever. And then you have to then you have to hook those things back together, which requires a lot of different um, enzymatic reactions. And not everybody, because of their internal terrain, because of their genetics or because of their cellular environment, they don't have the, the enzymatic capacity in order to put that NAC into and put it back together and then a separate step is turning it into glutathione. So the thing that I always tell patients is, okay, if you want to take NAC, that's fine. But if you're chronically ill, like, can we just skip all those steps that could have errors in each step of that process and just give you glutathione? Instead, it makes a lot more sense. Um, and with research nutritionals, the trifortify glutathione that you guys develop, you don't have to worry about absorption. So that process is take already taken care of. And and that's why I like that product. And I mean, that's what we use in our clinic. Oh, well, thanks for that. I mean, that's what we, we want to make sure that products are really working for people. And um, yeah, the, the published research on that came out very strongly about increasing glutathione intracellularly and increasing natural killer cell function. So um, that's, that's good to hear that you're seeing that with your patients. You know, I also have read an article that said that um, a lot of people think you know, the reason why you give NAC is because cysteine is a limiting factor. But one of the articles or a couple of articles I read were talking about cysteine is very tightly regulated by the body. So the ability to really increase cysteine levels is, an, is hard to do um, naturally in the body. So in addition to being able to break apart the glutathione into its components and then put it back together and get it absorbed, that that's possibly another issue why NAC doesn't do as much as we may want from a glutathione standpoint. It's a great anti-inflammatory. It's also great after going, going after certain biofilms. I mean, so NAC certainly has a role um, you know, from a you know, doctor-patient standpoint or just from a general health standpoint. But no, that's that's interesting. You're sharing that information with us. Thank you for that. Well, and I just, yeah, that, and yeah, you're absolutely right. And I love NAC as a mucolytic. So, right. you know, instead of putting somebody on Mucinex, you know, if they have a cough that's just not moving, I think NAC can be really helpful. Um, I just read something last week that be because, and of, of course, this isn't going to sound very eloquent because I didn't think we were going to talk about this, but there's so, <laughs> there's something to do with the disulfide bridges that are being utilized in the body. And they will, they will take up extra cysteine and hold onto that very tightly. So it can't be unbound and then used for things like making glutathione, which is, you know, going to help people detox and, and feel better. Oh, interesting. Interesting. And then you, you said earlier on too that you know one of the common symptoms that you the patients feel oftentimes is is a lack of energy. I mean, what do you think is going on there, and 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 how do you deal with it? 
Oh, yeah. Well, um, I mean, lack of energy can be because of a whole bunch of different things, right? I mean, it, it could be 20 different, 20 different reasons why somebody doesn't have energy. But in the end, to me, it always boils down to what's going on in the mitochondria. And so for the, for the listeners that don't know, and I'm going to, I'm going to keep this super simple. The mitochondria is this organelle that lives inside, inside the cells. And it's responsible for a lot of different things. And it's very, very important. It's a very important organelle. Um, but when we're looking at it in terms of energy production, what the mitochondria does is it shuttles things in and through. <clears throat> and then at the end, it makes water and generates ATP. And ATP is the currency of life. You know, if you don't have ATP, you don't you don't get to keep breathing. Um, and one of the problems that we're seeing more and more and more, you know, especially in the past 10 to 20 years, is that people's mitochondrial capability isn't operating the way it, the way it used to. So it's like taking a V8 and turning it into a little four box, you know, car that can't get up, can't get up the hill. And so the question for me is always, well, why? Right. What what's going on? We're not talking about inborn genetic mitochondrial errors. Right. What I'm talking about is a functional problem in the mitochondria itself. And when you think about the mitochondria, it's lined with fat. So it's a it's lipophilic. It, it can accumulate toxins that are fat soluble. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. I always think about, well, what's getting in the way of that mitochondria? If you can't get things into the mitochondria, like certain, you know, certain nutrients, then you need to remove those. Well, what if the shuttles, what if the buses that are running in and out of the mitochondria aren't working as efficiently as they can? Well, there's things that we can do for that. And then the, the most obvious thing is, are we providing ourselves as human beings with enough substrate to get into the mitochondria so it can do its job. You know, it's like you want to go on a hundred mile road trip, but you only put in a quarter tank of gas. You're, you're going to be pulled over on the side of the road. Yeah, it's interesting because, again, we, we think about the mitochondria, you know, primarily from an energy standpoint, which is you know what you're talking about. But you also mentioned, which I think is really true, the role it plays in you know, in inflammation and the immune system and signaling the immune system to do certain things. So the health of that mitochondria is is a big issue. Um, what are the issues that that cause the damage to the, those mitochondrial membranes that, you know, that are so important? Well, um, can I say it? Should I say it? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, that's a cop out. You know that you got to try oh, something I know. different. It's a, it's a wicked cop out. Yeah, that's why that's why I say it all the time. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So th there's a lot of different things that can get bound up in that fatty or lipophilic mitochondrial membrane. Certain heavy metals and metalloids will get in there and and, you know, they, they take up room. They cause oxidative damage so you know the cell recognizes that there's something foreign there and it starts to secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines um certain certain mycotoxins which are uh what's the easy way to describe a mycotoxin it's what mold exhales um does that kind of make sense like if mold were to take an out breath the mycotoxins is is what you would get. It's a little more complicated than that, but um, th those definitely cause mitochondrial problems. And you, it's very very important, especially if somebody's coming in and they're complaining of brain fog, any cognitive difficulties, low energy. Hey, I slept twelve hours and I still woke up and feel like I got run over by a truck. 
um, to improve how the mitochondrial functions and then obviously make sure that we're providing enough substrate so that 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 person's cellular environment can do what it's supposed to do. Because the body wants to operate, it wants to do its job, you know? It doesn't want to be encumbered with heavy metals and viruses and pesticides and fertilizers, which are all, mostly all lipophilic, by the way. They're all fat-soluble. So, you know, that's another thing that will get stored in in, in that mitochondria and, and cause problems. Um, so we need to work at removing those toxic insults and then, you know, bolstering and providing enough substrate so that the, the patients can, you know, do what they need to do. Go to the grocery store and take care of their kids and go to work and, you know, all, all the stuff. So so what is it you like to use for your patients to, to help with the mitochondria? Because, again, there's so many important roles that it fulfills. Yeah. So there's there's a couple different ways to look at it. So there's a lot of single nutrients that you can use that will help different areas of the mitochondria. Um, CoQ10 is a great example. So, I mean, this is going to sound like a paid promotion, and it, it's not. Um but the CoQ10 power that you guys make, great form of CoQ10. I use it all the time. Um, sometimes patients will need alpha lipoic acid in order to help their mitochondria work better. Sometimes people will need pantothenine or thiamine, so B5, B1, B2, um, in order to make sure that their mitochondria is working in the 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 issue becomes how many pills do you want to take, right? Because when you're when you're supporting organ function, working on detox, trying to clean up the toxic terrain, um, and now we're laying around the mitochondria, which you know how many vitamins and cofactors are, are involved in you know mitochondrial function. I mean, you're you're talking about a three page treatment plan, <laughs> so. For me, what I use is, I mean, again, I'll use single nutrients, especially if the patient is really sensitive or they don't tolerate, you know, certain B vitamins very well. But for most people, I put them on ATP 360, which I, I mean, I absolutely love. I've used it for years. Um, the studies on it are good. You only have to take three caps once a day. And that's true. That's what the label says. But I, when I first read that, I was like, hmm. I don't know about that. No, that's that's true. People will come back and say, my energy is way better. And, you know, Dennis, you've been in this world a long time. You know that with natural medicine, it's slow, man. Like, it takes time for it to work. It's not like you have a raging infection, take three days of an antibiotic and you're all better. That's not the way it works because we're slowly trying to get the body to do what it's supposed to do. Um, so when patients come back and they say, I felt that in natural medicine, that's a big deal. You know, it's like, oh, awesome. High five. Um, and there's, there's a couple things about that ATP 360 that I think are pretty legit. So the first one is instead of using regular alpha lipoic acid, that product uses R lipoic acid. So, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is the bioavailability. So when you put R lipo, which is super expensive, R lipoic acid is really expensive. Um, so that's why most supplement companies won't use it, right? Because it it they run into a price issue with it. Um, so you're you're doubling. I mean, you have a twofold increase in bioabsorption when you use R lipoic acid. And, you know, the papers on R lipoic acid, I mean, it's going to improve the function of the mitochondria. Um, and it's a heavy metal chelator, you know, a transition heavy metal chelator, which, you know, for me, being an environmental medicine doctor where I'm looking at those things, I always like to use the whole like two, two birds, one stone approach. And patients like it too, right? Because it saves them time and money. Um, and then the other thing about ATP 360 that I think is awesome is, you know, you guys put PQQ in it, which, I mean, PQQ is, it's an amazing antioxidant. 
So most antioxidants can be used a couple times before they're done, right? It's like stretching out a rubber band. You know, you stretch it a bunch of times and then before you know it, it's going to break. Like vitamin C, for example. Vitamin C you can use for four cycles and then it's done. That particular vitamin C molecule isn't going to isn't going to work anymore. PQQ has 20,000 catalytic cycles. Wow. 20,000 catalytic cycles. Um be, you know, b- before it's done and it makes your mitochondria bigger. So if you have bigger mitochondria, then they're going to work more efficiently. Um, and again, sorry for the long, winding answer answer to your question. <laughs> but yeah, I use ATP 360. I'll use single nutrients in some patients. But the reason why I use ATP 360 is because it's bougie in terms of the... <laughs> in terms I haven't heard of, that before. <laughs> In terms of the alpha lipoic acid, you're doing the R lipoic acid. Um, and then you guys were forward thinking enough to put that PQQ in there, along with all the other things that are in there too, right? That are going to support the mitochondria. And it helps people sleep better, which that was showed shown in, in one of the studies. I think one of the studies showed like a 68% improvement in sleep. And right. totally makes sense, right? Because if you're giving people energy during the day, then they're going to sleep better at night. Well, and interestingly, um, because that was sort of, it's counterintuitive to take a product that's going to help with energy, that's going to help you sleep. Um, But what we also looked at, because we know that cytokine function is really an issue. And when cytokine functions out of whack, we increase oxidative stress, oxidative stress increases, you know, cytokine function in a more chronic way both of them damage the mitochondrial membranes. And so we put tocotrienols in there um, as a way of trying to really help control the cytokine side of it. And so the researchers believe that's probably why the sleep came in um, so, so improved was because we were, you know, helping the cytokine functions, you know, function more naturally and more normally. Um, So I think that that's probably why that happened. And then of course, just repairing those mitochondrial membranes, because a lot of um, a, a, a lot of folks have mitochondrial membrane issues, so it's not hey put a bunch of CoQ10 only or a ton of ribose in there. But if you don't repair those membranes, the and the importance of that is because the mitochondrial um, electron transport chain is located within the membrane, so the membranes are damaged. You're not going to get optimal ATP production, and so it you know focuses on the two. So it's a really multiple mechanism of action type product. So it's. It's interesting to hear what your what your thoughts are on it and the results you're seeing. Yeah, and um, thanks for thanks for talking about the TOCA trials. I didn't I didn't I wasn't aware that that was the um, hypothesis for the for the sleep improvement. That makes a lot of sense. The other thing that I would offer too, and maybe I said this earlier, but I'm I'm going to say it again, just a different way. Um, you know, mitochondrial function is depleted or taxed during oxidative stress, heavy metal exposure, xenobiotic exposure, so foreign substances, right, you know, coming into your body. And some diseases, you know, will impair mitochondrial function as well. Um, And I mean, we could say the same thing about depleting intracellular glutathione levels. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, some of the issues really cover a wide breadth of, of the types of patients that a lot of practitioners are seeing, and of course you as well. So now this this is very interesting. Um, you know, to our listeners, we actually have this as a sort of a three-part series. Um, the next one is going to be talking about identifying and, and uh, in more detail talking about removing the toxins, cleaning up the terrain. And then after that, we're going to be talking more about modulating the immune system um, and, and getting the body from a, you know, from a cytokine standpoint, and um, pretty much in a number of different areas from immune standpoint, Im- improve the health of the patient also. Um, and, and so, I, I think at this point, you know, we can certainly take some questions on there, Doctor Wakeley. I know that uh, patients do have, or I should say, patients, listeners do, because we have a lot of practitioners on here, um, wanting to ask you questions as well. So, again, thank you for that. But um, please, let's see what questions we have. 
Yeah, absolutely. Just want to give a quick thank you to everyone for your comments. And uh, Wakely, it looks like you got a lot of love from your patients for joining us today. So that's so shout cool. out there. And uh, clearly this conversation is really relevant. People uh, dealing with exactly what we're talking about here today. And so I've got a handful of questions for you. Uh, Jody and Emily asked, what can a patient do in between visits with their doctor to relearn how to listen to their body's responses to stimuli such as food, allergens, supplements, exercise, et cetera? And what is the most efficient way, in your opinion, to communicate that to your doctor? That's, a, that's an awesome question. Thanks, Jody and Emily. Um, well, I can tell you that when I was healing from my complex chronic conditions, so I had Lyme disease and, and probably still do, but it, it doesn't really affect me anymore. Um, I paid very close attention and almost did self studies all the time. Um, like I, and I wasn't neurotic about it or obsessive about it. You, you know, you got to toe the line, but just listening, checking in with your system. Like, Oh, I ate that. How do I feel? You know, how I'm, I'm getting ready to have this meal that I haven't had in a really long time. How do I feel right now? And then you eat the thing or drink the thing or do the thing. And then check in with your system after. Um, I think there's so much stimuli in the world now that it can be hard to really pay attention to how things are affecting you. And the same can be said for exercise, right? Exercise is really, really good. If, if everybody got the appropriate and adequate amount of exercise for their body, we as a society would probably be a lot better. But it is a stress, so I would never tell a patient, unless my patient was like David Goggins, <laughs> to to go run 100 miles, right? Um, and then in terms of communicating that with your doctor, what I would say is just be just be totally honest with them. You know, doctors are teachers, and to be a good teacher, you have to be a good listener. So your doctor should listen and believe you, right? Because if you take something and you're like, I don't think that makes me feel good, let them know, you know? And um, most of us just want to do what's best for you guys, for you patients, and, and get you better. Um, there, shouldn't be an, there shouldn't be any ego involved, right? We're like, oh, theoretically, that should work for you. I don't care about any of that. I care about what's going on with you at a physiologic level. And if something doesn't make you feel good, then we stop it and try something else. Joel, I hope I answered that. Did I answer that? Yeah, I think so. And um, certainly uh, feel free um, to our audience, feel free to drop more questions. Or if you have a clarifying uh, for any of the answers, please feel free to go ahead and drop those uh, in the chat right now. I'll move on to the next question uh, from a doctor. How do you correct if someone has an outrageous reverse T3 value? Oh, yeah, that's that's good. So that's a really good question. Thank you for answering that. Um, okay, so first of all, it's going to depend on the other labs. So is there T3 total and free, uh, total and or three, and T4 compromised? If it is, that needs to be corrected. I am of the opinion that um, I think that is a good place for pharmaceuticals for a lot of people. And I've had really good luck with Cytomel and Synthroid or the generic versions of those. Um, they're cheap, they're easy for patients to take, and you definitely see changes pretty quickly. Um, and then in terms of fixing the reverse T3, you got to clean up the terrain because you need to ask the question, well, why is the body pumping the brakes? Like what's going on there? Is it an enzymatic issue where they're not converting to free T3? If so, then you can add certain nutrients and herbs to correct that. Like selenium is a great example. Um, clean up the terrain. Give the things that are going to push T4 to go to T3 as opposed to reverse T3. And then there's a medication that... that I use pretty frequently called low-dose naltrexone, um, which I have found clinically to help. There's not a lot of studies on it, but I find it to be pretty useful. 
Excellent. Thank you. All right. We've got a question from Dash. A friend <laughs> does not tolerate glutathione. Uh, natural killer cell activity increase or sulfur intolerance? Uh, great question. So could be either. Um, sometimes when you flood the body with an army to kill bad things, um, it's going to do its job. And the problem is you have to have mechanisms internally to be able to sweep up all the mess that was created. Um, so that would be one area that I'm looking at. And then in terms of sulfur sensitivity, yeah, that's definitely a real thing. The best test for that is to give a dose of molybdenum with the glutathione or right before the glutathione and see if they tolerate it a little bit better. And usually you'll know within within one dose, you can give some molybdenum, maybe wait a half an hour, 15 minutes to a half an hour, then give glutathione. And if, if there's no adverse reaction, then it's probably a sulfur sensitivity. And that is something that needs to be corrected because, yeah, sulfur is important. We can't live without sulfur. Right. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Sheila asks, when is the best time to take triforify glutathione? Morning, bedtime. Uh, she comments, yes, I do take glutathione and love the taste of the watermelon uh, that Dennis was sampling at an orthomolecular conference in Toronto many years ago. So way, way back. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, any, any comment from either of you on the timing to take um, that particular supplement? Dennis, why don't I go first? Because I, I feel like since, you know, this is your product, you may have a, a better answer than I do. For, for me, I, I don't care when patients take it as long as they hold it in their mouth for 60 seconds. I just want them to get it in. And yeah, so for, for me, I try and keep it simple. Dennis, do, do you have rules for that? No, I mean, I know generally people often say take glutathione uh, in the morning. Others say take it away from meals. But I think, again, if someone's low in glutathione, they're low in glutathione. But um, the, the important thing is getting it absorbed properly. And so the key is holding it in the mouth because we're getting that mucosal membrane absorption. Uh, and, and that, I, I, I think, is essential. And again, that's the research showed was that 28% increase in intracellular glutathione um, in, you know, in just two weeks with it. So I, I think any time you, you suggest they take it, I think, is, is fine. But I do think the most important thing is hold it in your mouth um, to get that absorption. Yeah, excellent. And uh, actually, uh, on a comment uh, related or a question related to uh, cellu cellular levels of glutathione, uh, somebody comments, I find that blood glutathione levels do not correlate with cellular levels. I still replace with glutathione if I think it's needed. Um, however, when I'm detoxifying, or example, when I'm detoxifying, do you agree? Um, any comment on cellular absorption of glutathione? Well, I think that... Um Blood tests for glutathione are pretty inaccurate. Um, I mean, it depends on the test. If you're looking at red blood cell levels and white blood cells, white blood cell levels, that's definitely going to be closer. Um, Dennis, wh what do you think? I, I think it's a good question, but I mean, one of the problems with the commercial testing is that most of them are testing plasma levels, right? And the, and so when you were saying, hey, the blood doesn't, it doesn't correlate, well, that's because just because it's in the plasma doesn't mean it got into the cell in, in the reduced form, which is where it needs to go to do its job. And so that's why I, I think when people talk about glutathione, especially, you know, a lot of the commercial labs, I'm not aware, maybe there was somebody at this point, but I'm not aware of a commercial lab that's actually testing intracellular. And so... When we did the research, I mean, we went to Penn State University. They're the ones who, who designed and, and did the research. They had the ability to measure intracellular, and I think that's the difference. So it's not really looking at blood and saying, hey, that's working. It's got to get into the cell, and, and that's what you need to have happen. And unfortunately, with this product, that's what did happen or does happen. Excellent. Daniel asks, can we be on selenium uh, long term? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. You're taking me back to my like first year in medical school bio, biochemistry class. So there, there is a condition in um, medicine called selenosis where you can get 
too much selenium and um i think the main symptom that you see from selenosis too much selenium is brittle nails and brittle hair but uh, i'll have to consult my board exam uh <laughs> review to to make sure but if you're taking 200 micrograms of selenium which is a pretty common standard dose um i think you can do that for a really long time before you're going to have any adverse effects but it depends <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. Uh, we have another question from Jody and Emily. Can you speak a little to the downstream effects of TBI and head trauma on the body, more specifically the digestive system and hormones? Mm. Yeah, there's there's definitely people out there that are better than I am at, at talking about this um, because that's all they do. They just specialize in that. But um, so I, I'm going to give you my theory, and this is purely based on my own, you know, uh, clinical clinical experience in dealing with chronic complex infections and toxicity. The body is really good at shoving stuff in the closet. What I mean by that is like mom told me to clean my room while she was at the grocery store, <laughs> and then she's pulling in the driveway. Oh, no, I was busy playing video games. I'm just going to shove everything in the closet. So that goes for heavy metals. There, there's a lot of different toxins that the body will kind of get out of the bloodstream. Let's get it into the tissue. See no evil, hear no evil. When you're in a car accident or you have a traumatic brain injury, or the, I mean, I've had patients fall off a bicycle before and, and then develop I mean, really significant, complex, chronic issues that are not related to them falling on their knee, right? I think some of this stuff comes out of the tissue space, gets into the bloodstream, starts to cause immune reactions, and, um, you know, now you're on the, you're kind of on the merry-go-round and you got to deal with it and clean it up and, and get the stuff out of long-term storage, get it out of the closet and get it cleaned out. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, somebody commented, how do you correct a sulfur, sulfur sensitivity? Uh, comment was my diet is so limited uh, because of that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. The, um, <clears throat> well, I mean, acutely you're going to give molybdenum, which, which is going to help with the sulfur sensitivity so that people can have a little bit more of a varied diet so they can get the nutrients and the substrates in so they can run the machinery. Um, I use a technique in my practice called low-dose allergen therapy and low-dose immunotherapy. I've used it for a long, long time, and that has really seemed to help people. Um, because what you're doing there is you're, you're targeting the dendritic cells that are kind of the directors of traffic in the immune system, and you can end up down-regulating this one branch. It's a Th17 cell. Um that I always, when I talk about it with patients, I always say, sometimes these cells are like henny penny. Oh my God, the sky is falling. What are we gonna do? I don't know, let's let's just create a bunch of inflammation. Maybe that will help. <laughs> um, and you know, all that does is, it's like it's like going to the party with the guy who's always depressed. At, at the end of the night, everybody's like sulking in the corner. That's the same thing that happens in the immune system, you know? So if you can correct those Th17 cells and how they're behaving, um, a lot of times people will get over their sulfur sensitivities. So I use LDA and LDI. Well, that's great, Dr. Wakely. Um, I, I know we're at a little over an hour at this point, so we hmm. probably should call it. But I want to thank you very much for taking the time to address all the practitioners as well as the patients who um, are have been listening. And I certainly hope to all of our listeners, you found this is um, is useful and something that can help you in your practices or also in patients, you know, in improving your overall health. So, Dr. Wakely, thank you very much for your time. That was so fun. We should do it again. <laughs> oh, we are. That's right. We are. That's right. This is yeah. one of three. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, have, Dennis. That, that was great. Thanks for having have me. A have a great day. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye.